Uh, today we're going to continue our exploration of early uh, Renaissance art in Florence and in central Italy. And uh, what we're going to look at today is sculpture, especially the sculpture of Donatello, uh, another one of those nicknames, uh, Donato di Banco, I forget his name. He's known for that nickname, just like Masaccio is. These guys are all, these guys are all uh, in it together. What I'm showing you here is a little bit of St. George as a teaser for later on, because you can see St. George seems like he's ready to step right out of his niche and into the real world. Um, and that's exactly what, uh, what artists were doing. Oops. I can't seem to advance. You're not advancing? There it goes. Okay. okay. So just a recap of, of recent things. We've compared the depicted space of late uh, medieval art, like this Giotto, uh, where there seems to be kind of a shallow space. Uh, um, and, uh, and with a deep space of perspective. And perspective is really based on the idea of the Renaissance window. Then is the picture plane or the surface of the picture, whether it be a panel or a canvas or a, a wall even, is conceived of, is thought of as if it were transparent. So then instead of seeing uh, figures on the wall, we seem to look through the wall to another world. Um, and here's a, a later diagram kind of showing you the idea of, of perspective. And perspective is all based really on that on the idea of the picture being a window onto the world. Uh, and it's a world uh, similar to ours in that it's measurable and it's scientific and so forth, but it's different than our world in that the world that the Renaissance artists were trying to depict was not our imperfect world, but is, uh, but is the, the, ideal, the ideal world as it appears in the mind of God, as it was meant to be from before time, before the fall of man. And the, and the entry of death and so forth on the stage. So it's interesting these artists are uh, combining ideas from Christianity, specifically the idea of incarnation, uh, of God becoming a person or, or, or this divine spark within everybody, a kind of a, a Christ potential, I guess you'd have to say. But on the other hand, looking back to the ancient pre-Christian world that they're looking more directly at, the ancient Greeks and Romans, and seeing in the thought of Plato, the ideal world beyond time and space from whence we are all taken to come. And it's that ideal world, that immaterial world from before our birth, uh, that is the conduit for us to understand and appreciate beauty in our own imperfect world. We're able to see things uh, in that way uh, that we can begin to, uh, that is, um, Instead of showing our own world with all its imperfections and sin, moral imperfections, as well as physical imperfections, uh, 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 and show instead an idealized world. And Brunelleschi, the architect, was the first to codify the, the uh, laws of perspective, but his buddy Masaccio, and that's a nickname, again, a big Tommy, Maso, or Tommaso Masaccio, and he did this, the very first painting done in 3D, uh, 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 pictorial space, uh, and people were amazed by the realism of this. It looks like there's really a niche in which this crucifixion is taking place, and we can actually measure the coffers of the ceiling to find out how far everyone is apart. And here you can see there's a little bit of gold leaf attached to the, the uh, halos of God the Father and of uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, which has uh, worn off because uh, gold leaf can't be put, uh, embedded right into fresco. It has to be added al, al secco afterwards. Uh, but still, it's in, it's in great uh, uh, condition. And we looked at this other Masaccio, a wonderful painting of Adam and Eve being uh, cast out of paradise. And we uh, noticed there that there's the idea of chiaroscuro, um, chiaroscuro, which means light and dark. And uh, Masaccio was one of the first, besides just perspective, linear perspective, to also use chiaroscuro, light and dark, to have a specific light source, in this case, coming from the upper right, that everything that faces the sun uh, is illuminated, everything that turns away is uh, in uh, shadow. And this is how it came out when it was cleaned uh, in the 1980s. And, uh, and you can see that the fig leaves came off uh, with the uh, with the grime and the dirt, fresco is a wonderful medium 
painted right into fresh plaster because it retains its color, it doesn't crack and so forth. And so uh, we have frescoes that are thousands of years old from ancient Romans and Etruscans that still look beautiful. This, I just saw it uh, in January again, one of my old favorites is coming to this Braccaccia Chapel in Florence. Notice the idealization of the form is there's not even dirt on the people's feet. Uh, they're, they're just perfect. But also there's this psychological depth that we just don't find in medieval art that takes us into the emotional world, the individual subjective world of Adam and Eve and their remorse and their regret and their shame. Um, and, and this portrayed in this way and with such humanity that we really can understand the, how they feel. Um, and this is new, this is new. And this comes with this idea of humanism, that man is the measure of all things. So that as we are putting together this idealized world of the Renaissance, we use the human uh, vantage point, the human subjectivity as the way of, um, as the way of entering into that world and uh, empathizing with the humanity and the emotions of, of, the, of our of first parents. Um, I just wanted to contrast uh, this with the, the other by his buddy Masolino. Masaccio means big Tommy, Masolino means little Tommy. Uh, although Masolino was actually older than Masaccio and may have been in the same studio uh, uh, as, the, as he was trained in. But you can see here, and this is just the wall just uh, opposite the Adam and Eve in this Bracacci Chapel. You can see here that Adam and Eve in Mussolino's are idealized and beautiful. They don't have any dirt on them. They don't have any hair on their body or anything that would uh, indicate their kind of human animal nature. But at the same time, uh, they don't have the gravitas. They don't have that weight. There is a consistent light source. And it's interesting that both of the artists use the existing light source that illuminates the chapel that's above the altar. Uh, 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 and so it casts uh, the uh, light on, uh, from the upper right in the Masaccio and from the upper left on the Masolino. Uh, but I thought these would be good because you can see how they just, they don't, their feet do not completely touch the ground. They do not have that weight, that gravitas, despite their Maraschiro. Uh, and so uh, here you can really see how much Masaccio uh, outstrips his uh, his, uh, his master uh, and it goes beyond it uh, into a world not only of greater reality and greater idealization, but also greater humanity, greater psychological depth. I love this stuff. And Michelangelo did all sorts of drawings when he was a teenager of the Brancacci Chapel. It was, it was something he returned to again and again. This, this monumental sense that Masaccio has in his work, and it just kills me that he died when he was 28 because uh, 28 is very young and uh, is just on the brink of who knows uh, what sort of greatness this artist could have achieved had he lived longer. Uh, perspective is being used here, uh, but also chiaroscuro, light and dark, and also idealization, uh, and also gravitas, so that sense of weightiness and heaviness that they possess, and all these things uh, 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 are in contrast to the slightly older master, still an early Renaissance master, but without the, the, the sort of uh, monumental uh, heroism that, uh, that, uh, that Masaccio shows us. So we had looked a couple of weeks ago at Giotto di Modone, the grandfather of the Renaissance in the 1300s. After the Black Death, then we had looked at the Theorist and uh, architect Filippo Brunelleschi in Florence is really uh, Brunelleschi's uh, city, Masaccio Bertani. Uh, and now today we're going to look at Donatello. Uh, Donato is Adamo, and Donatello was little Donny, so they all had these nicknames. They all knew each other. They all had a pleasant rivalry with each, with each other, uh, but they were kind of in their own respective fields, being a maestri of different disciplines. And so you see this wonderful sense of these artists being friends and beyond just their own, uh, beyond just a personal, uh, beyond just a professional relationship, having a you know, personal dimension to their work. And then until all three of these great masters come in the early 1400s, which is the subject of our, uh, of our search today uh, and during this, uh, and during this uh, 
the series. Uh, here, I, I want to just show you some uh, niche uh, statues from the late Gothic period. And uh, I, I just want to show how really self-contained each of these individuals are in their little niche, uh, often with uh, th attributes that, uh, that describe what their sainthood is. This, for example, I recognize as St. Cecilia, the a patron of music, and she holds a sort of organ, uh, a pipe organ, a miniature pipe organ in her arms, and other saints have that. But they're very much in their own individual kind of niches. And we even see that later here at Strasbourg, for example, where we have the prince of this world, who is uh, actually the devil, uh, holding a, an apple and uh, enticingly in front of these uh, three uh, muses. If you look to the back of his, uh, if you walk around, you see his back is covered with snakes and, uh, and uh, rats and uh, insects of various types to show that beyond his uh, physical princely beauty, he's prince of this world, but he's, he is, uh, uh, there's nothing behind that facade of beauty except of his rottenness, this corruptibility. Um, and so he proudly can hold the apple almost like a, a defiant second Adam. But notice how they're very much in their niches. Here they begin to, to look at each other and see that they're not quite in exactly uh, their own world. This, uh, this second figure especially seems to be um, responding to the enticement of the prince of this world uh, here. Uh, but when we go to Renaissance art, we'll see that there is a a substantial sort of difference where, the, where the, uh, the sculpture sort of comes out of its own space and walks into our own space. So there's that breakdown between our world of imperfection and the ideal world beyond the threshold of the niche, uh, which is, is given to us now in three-dimensional corporality. And this is the Or San Michele, and it's the, uh, the granary and the uh, the place where all the guilds had their meetings. So this is the guild hall, I guess you'd say. And there was also a granary in there. Uh, it's, it's very substantial. It's right in the very center of Florence, not uh, very far from the Duomo. Um, and uh, each of the guilds, the guilds were the professional organizations uh, that ran the town and ran the, the merchantile aspects of the town. So there was, for example, a guild of cloth makers. Cloth was important, wool was important. Uh, a guild of uh, armorers and, uh, and people who made uh, weaponry uh, and farm implements. There was a guild of, uh, so, so there's, there's different guilds uh, that, uh, that reflect the governance of the city. Because remember, Florence had thrown off its duke, uh, ran him out of town in the 1200s, and was an independent uh, republic and thought of itself very much as the new Athens. So this idea of democracy that uh, inspired uh, the Republic of Plato and um, is, is very much, uh, and so they really thought of themselves as the new Athens, right? But Athens was to the ancient Greeks, so Florence is to the modern world. And if you walk around the Orsan Michele, there's not, uh, it, everything's kind of outside. It's one of the, uh, one of the monuments in Florence, which you can appreciate the greatest art is really on the outside in these various niches that are dedicated to the various different guilds that ruled Florence uh, during that period. There's also a gypsy woman you see uh, seated on uh, there uh, asking for money. Uh, uh, gypsies are a really interesting um, aspect of Italian culture and uh, you'll see them in all the big cities. And uh, in, in Rome, there's actually an RV park for the gypsies. They don't having wagons there in RVs now, um, outside of town. Uh, an important aspect, a minority within uh, Italian culture. Um, anyway, here is the, um, here's the Or San Michele, and I just want to look at some of these different niches. Uh, Donatello's uh, first great one was for the woolen industry, the Cloth Makers Guild, which was a very important and influential and wealthy guild uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the Republic of Florence. And uh, here he does a statue of St. Mark. St. Mark was one of the uh, disciples of Jesus, one of the inner circle of the 12. Uh, uh, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, he was the scribe to St. Peter, who was one of the inner circle of the 12. Mark 
according to tradition, uh, wrote down the story as Peter sort of told it to him. So he was a disciple of Peter and the writer of the first gospel uh, in the New Testament, the first book of the New Testament. Uh, or the oldest book, the oldest of the four Gospels as we are, uh, in the New Testament. Then here we can see uh, he shows uh, St. Mark in a position of uh, relaxation. His feet have that gravitas and actually make a heavy impression on the little uh, a pillow that he seems to stand on. Uh, uh, and he has, uh, of course, his Gospel in his hand that uh, work. And um, and it's, it's a, a posture that Donatello and other artists of his time look back to ancient Greco-Roman sculpture and notice that instead of the body being shown with equally distributed weight, that there is this weight shift, which they call contraposto. So contra, you know, uh, uh, counterpoise, I guess is, it would be uh, an approximate uh, translation of it. Uh, postal meaning also the, the, uh, the cognitive posture, because it is a sort of posture uh, in which instead of being uh, symmetrical, it's an asymmetrical posture where there's a shift of weight that gives it a sort of balance and harmony. Uh, uh, and, and so in here you can see uh, the, uh, the hip, on, and this, this is called the engaged leg, and the engaged leg actually takes all the weight. The other leg is bent and just as a supporting position. But he, because the, uh, the engaged leg is engaged and takes all the weight of the body, it shifts the pelvis to this downward kind of slant um, going toward the non-engaged leg. On the other hand, the shoulders kind of uh, uh, are, are the opposite way. And there's a slight turn to the whole thing, contraposto so that if you saw it in three-dimensional space, you'll see the sort of a twist uh, to it as well. And you can see that very clearly, I think, when you see Donatello St. Mark on the right compared to uh, Ghiberti's um, St. John the Baptist from another niche in the very same, you kind of walk around the corner there and you see in another niche uh, the uh, San Giovanni, and, uh, which is in bronze. Um, now, the, uh, the uh, Ghiberti, the earlier one in bronze, has a sort of a sweep. It does have kind of a, a, a weight shift, but it's more of an S-curve. It's more of a sort of an S-curve that goes through the body. And the, the uh, folds in the garment reflect that curve, that S-curve. They have these deep uh, curving uh, folds that give form to the body, and, and most of the weight is on the engaged leg. But we see here in, in St. Mark a much more, a much greater gravitas, and much more of an indication of the presence of the body underneath. This goes back to this humanism, whereas, uh, whereas the earlier Ghiberti, the body seems almost lost in these uh, folds of the heavy fabric that kind of define uh, the form. Whereas in the St. Mark, the body is clearly visible underneath. You can see uh, where the knee uh, uh, comes here, uh, displacing uh, the folds into, into, um, into smaller um, uh, uh, shapes that reveal the form underneath them. Similarly here, with the engaged leg, he, he emphasizes the downward thrust of it by having the the garment goes straight down, hangs straight down in front of the, the engaged leg, which is really engaged and which really takes the entire, uh, the entire weight of the body. And of course, this shifts the, um, the hips to this angle. And as we had seen in our, uh, our, uh, our depiction here, the, uh, the shoulders go the opposite way. And the whole thing is given a sort of twist like that. And so it has a great deal of grazie, a great deal of grace, as well as weight. It has weight, it has substance, there is a real body. This isn't a ghost, this isn't a spirit, uh, this isn't a, a, a light, uh, you know, a, a invisible ghost or anything like that. It's a real flesh and blood human being that has weight and that the fabric has weight. And the fabric is not as heavy as the fabric in the earlier piece, because he wants to reveal um, the body underneath. Now, one of the things you may have already noticed is that the proportions are sort of 
strange in this sculpture. It's larger than life size. It's about seven or eight foot tall. So it's so slightly larger than life size. Then it's in this niche in the Or San Michele. And uh, as you can see here, the head looks too big for the body, especially I think you see if you look from the knees down, the scale that the body seems to be, and it's almost as, as, as you move up uh, the figure through the waist and the large hands and up through the monumental chest and shoulders and that supreme head sort of balanced on the top. And you see that it's almost like, a, a, what do you call it, the, the image in a, uh, in a, when you look uh, the wrong way through binoculars and things get uh, small. Uh, and it has this, and, and, and it, it, actually, when Donatello had finished the sculpture, he invited the guild members that had commissioned it, that were in charge of this commission, to visit him in his studio. And they had only paid him half up front. They were gonna pay the other half, and it stated in the contract upon, you know, that it was uh, suitable uh, for the niche and fit and so forth. So there was a, an escape clause that they had there uh, in, that they could reject it if it were not uh, properly proportioned and so forth. Think of the studios. They said, Maestro, this is, this is a lovely statue in many ways, but the proportions are all off. And Donatello said, don't worry about that. I can adjust that. And I'm sure the guild members thought, well, how can you adjust a carved marble? You know, how are you going to all this clay, maybe you could uh, change it, but with marble, like how is you going to get all this? He said, don't worry. And he, he wanted the, uh, the statue to be hoisted up to the niche. And it's a little above eye level. Your eye level here comes right about at the cushion where his feet are. So you're looking up uh, at the statue there. And so what he did is he had the workman create a, a curtain around the uh, niche so that people couldn't see him working in there. And then he, he with inside that curtain uh, enclosure, he had the workers hoist the sculpture up and place it there in the niche. And then he chased them out. And then he took some tools and he banged them around to make it sound like he was doing some sculpture things in there. And they were outside of the curtain wondering, what is this you know, artist, what's he doing here? And then he said, take the curtain down, and they took the curtain down, and lo and behold, it looked perfect. And they said, we don't know how you did this, Maestro, but it's, it's perfect for the niche. Well, actually, what it is, is, is Donatello realized that you'll be sit, standing kind of below this sculpture, and this, this exaggerates it too much in this particular photo, but he realized that to make the head and the shoulders larger, because you're going to be below it, and it will be distorted by the perspective. And so to compensate for that uh, perspective diminution in the head, so the head still had its, you know, its, uh, the gravitas and the importance that he wanted it to have, that heroic expression, uh, very determined, by the way, the expression is, he's determined. Uh, uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's a marvelous story that Vasari tells us. By the way, most of the anecdotes that I have come from this marvelous book, a four volume book called The Lives of the Most Excellent Architects, Painters, and Sculptors by Giorgio Vasari, V-A-S-A-R-I, uh, Vasari. I love Italian because there's no, uh, if you can say it, you can spell it. It's a totally phonetic language. Giorgio Vasari, around 1550, writes, um, writes a history, an anecdotal sort of history, and he did a lot of research by talking to people who were pupils or or were uh, uh, people that had known him. And, and some of the stories are probably kind of apocryphal, uh, but it makes for charming reading. And really Vasari is the first art historian of sorts because he's a painter, he's not a very good painter, uh, but he's an excellent art historian and is wonderful at weaving these tales. And especially I would, if you pick up a Vasari, um, especially the, uh, the, uh, the portion on Michelangelo, would make, the biography of Michelangelo is just absolutely stunning and tells a bunch of wonderful little anecdotes. Uh, so this was a success. Then this was an early success for the artist so that he was able to use this, his uh, depiction of St. Mark for this important commission right in the center of town of Los Angeles um, as a springboard uh, for later. And so it kind of represents in some ways the, the way the Duomo, the way 
uh, designing uh, successfully the dome of the Florence Cathedral really uh, established uh, the career of, uh, of um, Brunelleschi as the foremost architect of the time. In the same way, I think that uh, the St. Mark is a sort of a manifesto of the new sculpture, of the new embodied sculpture, of a, of a, of a, a sculpture that uh, begins to move out of the niches that people uh, put them in. I think this is even more dramatically uh, evident in his wonderful St. George, uh, which is in another niche on the outside of Or San Michele as well. Um, and, and actually the sculptures that you see in the guild hall are copies uh, because they decided to leave these uh, you know, 500, 600 year old statues out to get rained on and so forth was not a good idea. So in the early 20th and late 19th century, these exact copies, and I mean exact copies. So even when there are chips uh, that, uh, like you see here in the, um, in, the, uh, in the shield that St. George holds, there are some chips out there. The copy also copies the chips that are worn off. So that when I took my students uh, to Florence, we didn't go see uh, the ones inside. We saw them in situ out, outdoors. And I think this is a great compromise because the Italians are really, really good at making exact copies. And I'm not talking a rough copy, all right? I'm a trained art historian and I cannot see the difference. So they are, they're incredible. Anyway, uh, when you go there, you want to see it in its original niche, in its original setting, because I think this is part of its excitement. And St. George, uh, you know, the legend of St. George and the dragon, and he saves uh, this uh, woman from the dragon. If I can go back to Ghiberti again, and Ghiberti actually is a very interesting artist in his own right and was originally trained as a goldsmith, and he did the beautiful uh, Doors of Paradise for the baptistry there. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry to use him as the, as the uh, foil against Donatello, but I think he does represent that earlier that earlier, essentially medieval idea of sculpture. And uh, here, uh, again, uh, Donatello's um, uh, uh, St. George uh, is, is in contrapasto, uh, but seems almost to step outside of the niche, as, as if he's ready to move uh, outside. He's not relaxed in that niche, as St. Giovanni is there, but he seems to be ready and willing and able to just step right out and go to the defense of people. And here is actually, this is the original, uh, which is in the Bargello, which is just gee, a block and a half away. Uh, everything is very walkable in Florence. Uh, the block away is the Bargello, where the many Michelangelo's and many of the original sculptures that they had to remove from the facades of various um, of things, um, like the Campanile, also there in Florence, where there are monumental copies of the work. Uh, of the Renaissance masters. Uh, here is, um, so here you can see kind of steps out of the, of, the, uh, of the niche as if he's, as if he can no longer be contained by the position that society had allotted to an artist at that time. Uh, I mean, it's a metaphorical stepping out of the niche as well as a, a literal uh, seeming like the body is enlivened enough that it can come uh, alive and step out of its niche. But in many ways, the whole idea of Florence, the whole idea of Florence being run by the masters of the guilds rather than by an, an aristocrat whose uh, position was uh, due solely to the, uh, you know, the accident of his birth. Here was a sense in this bourgeois culture, this capitalist culture, these self-made men who had worked their way up through apprenticeship and through journeyman status and so forth and made it. But one of the things that we, we do see um, and, uh, in the early Renaissance here was the status of the artist. And, and I'll, I'll get back to St. George in a minute, but I just want to take this time here to talk a little bit about the status of the artist. There were two levels. There were the liberal arts, like music and geometry and, um, and uh, astronomy and so forth. And, and then there were the, the manual arts, the hand arts. And the manual arts included, besides sculpture and painting, 
also, um, um, you know, basket weaving and uh, baking, bakeries. And they were all run by the same sort of system where you have an apprentice and then the apprentices uh, live with a maestro and help uh, with things. The workshop of a Renaissance artist was never the lone thing that we have with Picasso working alone in the studio in the 20th century. Instead, we have this vast workshop of 20, 30 assistants who live in uh, uh, with the house of the maestro and so forth. And perhaps in a later uh, uh, installment here, we can talk more about that apprenticeship system. But essentially, in the social status of social hierarchies of who is uh, upper class and who is lower class, the artists were on the same level, visual artists uh, were on the same level as um, bakers or as shoemakers. They were a respected craft and people were paid well for their craft, but they were, if you had artists working in your house, making a painting, let's say, for your garden or for the living room or doing a fresco or something like that, when dinner time came, the artists would eat in the kitchen with the servants because that was their, that was their level. And so what we see in these early Renaissance artists is not only wanting to, uh, to, uh, to uh, do their art and to advance art toward this ideal that they saw was kind of a, almost a divine kind of calling, uh, but that the, um, but that the artist, therefore, was not just someone who was making shoes the way his father and the way his father's father and father's father had done, but rather they were explorers on the, on the frontier of a new kind of way of conceiving of art. And along with this went a, a different view of the artist. The artist not just as a shoemaker who's plying his craft, but the artist rather as someone who has the ability to see through the, the, um, the imperfections in our world, the sort of underbrush, and to see through to the divine essence of things and represent that divine essence, that ideal form that, uh, as God had intended them to be before, before the fall. So the artist is beginning to see themselves, and Donatello, I'm sure, felt them himself this way, as a, a person who was on the same level as a philosopher or as a musician. Uh, and one of the things that separated the manual arts from the liberal arts was having a mathematically based system uh, or theoretical system that underlied. And so, for example, music, was considered to be a liberal art because music theory is mathematical. And actually, I've heard that Einstein actually wrote some string quartets, although he couldn't really read music very well, uh, because it's all mathematical. And astronomy, uh, the same. And even architecture, because of the use of engineering tools and in mathematics, it's considered to be a mathematical based thing. But now, with the advent of perspective, of uh, a, a mathematically correct, way of depicting a three-dimensional world on a flat two-dimensional surface. Now, with the advent of this, an argument could be made that the arts were now on the level of the liberal arts, that they were, uh, and maybe even higher than some of the liberal arts, because the artist has the divine gift to be able to see through the veil of imperfections of our world to the core essence and the beauty, the inherent beauty that God had meant everyone to be at this time. Now, of course, you don't have to believe all this to appreciate it. And in fact, there are a lot of things that are wrong with this uh, Neoplatonic kind of theory of beauty in many ways. Um, but I'm telling it to you, not that you'll become an avid believer in it, but that you can see what they were trying to do. The artists were grappling with these theoretical and even philosophical sort of issues. And we will see these come to a, a greater head later in the century. We're looking now at the first half of the 1400s. And I just uh, found out that we may be doing another series on top of this uh, for the autumn. That's going to be another three that will look at the second half of the century, where we see these, these ideas of the artist going from a workman, uh, a manual a laborer, to a genius uh, who is touched by God. Uh, uh, and is given the vision to see through the, the, uh, the uh, veil 
uh, uh, to the divine truth. Now, I want to compare here. It's interesting that, and and the um, and the um, the Saint George is later than the San Marco, uh, which was kind of his uh, foundational piece. But you can see, and it's the object. It's in the same building. You just have to walk around the corner to see the other statue. But I want to just point out how ready St. George is to move out of his niche. He is in contrapposto, and you can see that the, this leg, I guess is his the left leg, is the engaged leg, but the other leg also does support some weight, so that uh, uh, St. George is, is ready to move. He's ready to spring into action. He's not as relaxed as St. Marcus. He's, he's ready. He's nervous. He has a sort of of energy where we feel that his body is tensing all up for a great sort of confrontation that's going to happen. Now this guild, unlike the earlier one for the St. Mark, was the guild of, 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 of um, uh, textiles. This was the guild of the metal formers who made shields, who made weapons, who made swords, who made uh, helmets and that sort of thing. And originally uh, St. George had a sword here which was actually made by one of the guild members, and it stuck right out into our space. So it's almost like a, almost a dangerous sort of stepping out of the niche uh, in this sense. And I guess he also had a helmet on uh, originally, but those have uh, long uh, ceased to be there. And we, we know they were there because there are remnants of the metals uh, uh, in, in the hand and so forth. So that must have made it even more of something that moves out of its, out of its own sphere, moves out of, the realm of pure art and into the world of action. And you can see the face, the face is dynamic. I love Donatello. Um, he has such psychological insights into, into his subject matter. And you can see here is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a worried uh, St. George who, uh, who uh, is, uh, and especially if we compare it to the Ghiberti, the St. John, the Baptist Baptist we've seen before. And I realize there's a certain, you know, uh, comparing apples and oranges here to a certain extent because the uh, St. George is a marble statue that's carved, whereas the Donatello is a, I mean, the earlier Ghiberti is a bronze statue. But I think even here you can see how the, the greater psychological depth of Donatello, really um, a human being that has motivation, that has worries, that has psychological sort of depth to it. And I think it's just marvelous, the face. And I think he teaches us also a moral lesson here about what is the nature of courage. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage, Donatello seems to be telling us, courage, true courage, is you're afraid and you do it anyway. Uh, and and then that sort of moral encouragement, that the thing that separates a hero like St. George from regular guys like me is not that they're so extraordinary, but that they're able to get through their fear and to go ahead and do things anyway with that sort of boldness. But you can see the, the apprehension in his face. And I think if we compare it, and this is another, uh, this is another uh, statue, another artist that Michelangelo looked uh, carefully at, if we compare Michelangelo's David, the, of the Colossus of David, to the uh, smaller uh, Dantello, I, I, I really prefer the earlier one because I think it has more psychological depth. Michelangelo, although magnificent, heroic, uh, you know, with his nostrils that are flaring and, uh, you know, his, his incredible machismo and all that, but it's, there's something that's superhero about it, that Donatello, the greater weakness, the, 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 even the weaker chin, for example, uh, it gives us a more of a particular human being and not so much an idealized sort of God uh, that uh, is fearless, but rather a man who, uh, who has the normal uh, fears and apprehensions. It's, it's marvelous. It's one of my very favorite sculptures. But, but the real treat, and a lot of people fail to see this, is underneath the niche, and here we can just see the boots of St. George above us, and we see that there's a, a relief sculpture, a bar relief sculpture on the bottom that is incredible. Um, and it shows St. George attacking and driving his lance through the, the heart of the uh, dragon on his left, while the damsel in distress is at his right. And what I've done is I've brought in 
Here's another um, less subtle photograph of it uh, that is where, where it's lighted in such a way that you can see it more clearly. But one of the things Donatello does here in this bas relief sculpture is he utilizes perspective so that you can see, if I get my arrow going here, this, uh, this arcade here, this, these arches seem to recede into a space and behind them are trees. It's hard to see because what Donatello does is the figures like of St. George and the dragon and the woman uh, are kind of, they emerge from the flatness of the marble to a certain extent. So they're about half of their, uh, you know, they're about half modeled. They don't come out completely, uh, but they're embedded. But as he goes back into the uh, depth, he, um, he does it lighter and lighter. So there's a heavier, more three-dimensional relief in the main figures uh, and then as you go more toward the background, the relief goes lower and lower and lower into what they came up with a word for it. Uh, uh, relievo scottico, uh, which means scratched. Uh, and it's hard to see, but when you're in the original, and this actually is a more a, a clear depiction of it. It has this softness to it, as if Donatello is not so much forming figures in the real world as he is fashioning the marble in such a way as to duplicate how the eye sees light reflecting off things, so that it has an atmospheric quality as you're moving into the depths of it, as you move beyond uh, this arcade into this, it, it's almost like there's a mist um, that's, um, that's uniting everything, that's, that's a, a, a sort of an atmosphere uh, in between us and the figures, softening them, and, and so that we see them uh, uh, as they are illuminated. So this is a new kind of uh, idea of sculpture as well. Um, it's where he's using perspective and using even aerial perspective. Now there's another great uh, uh, work of bas-relief uh, by Donatello that's in nearby um, Siena. And Siena is a, a wonderful, beautiful little medieval jewel. And it's about an hour's bus ride from uh, Florence. So it's a very uh, easy track. Uh, and if you're staying in Florence, uh, to just take an afternoon to go to Siena, a beautiful uh, uh, city. And there at the baptistry at the cathedral are a number of bas-reliefs in, 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 um, in bronze. And Donatello did the one of the, uh, the Herod's Feast. And here you can see uh, Herod, uh, and this is, um, just so you can see, it's, uh, the bronze is uh, positioned inside this marble uh, water basin, so that this is a baptismal font. So you could take a baby and hold it over the font and, and baptize it. There's water in there like that. And you can see in the front here is a, is a, is a, uh, sculpture by another artist of the baptism of Christ. But here we, we, we see uh, Donatello's uh, dramatic scene uh, of the decapitation of, of, uh, of, uh, of St. John the Baptist. Now, um, just so if you're not familiar with the story, John the Baptist is a uh, um, uh, religious uh, person. He's a very marginal sort of person. He's not a priest. He's not an insider to the religion, but he's more like a crazy person. Uh, talking about redemption and sin and so forth, and he's baptizing people in the, uh, in the Jordan River, uh, which he's using as kind of a large mikvah, I guess, as a way of saying it. And, um, and, and one of the things he criticized is Herod, the, um, the, the, uh, the ruler, the puppet ruler of the Romans, uh, who, uh, who uh, leads a decadent lifestyle. And, uh, and so, um, and because John the Baptist had criticized uh, Herod and his wife and his daughter as being uh, uh, less than morally upright and really unworthy of being a king, uh, 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 Herodotus, his wife, urges the daughter uh, to see if she might be able to seduce Herod into killing John the Baptist. He had arrested the Baptist and he was languishing in prison, but he was afraid that perhaps the Baptist really was from God 
and he was superstitious enough not to want to kill him. So, um, so uh, he, when he's at the, the feast and he's probably drank far too much, uh, Salome, his uh, daughter, teenage daughter, uh, said she'll do anything, uh, you know, uh, he would give anything to see her dance. And so she does a seductive dance and then afterwards said, what well, I want. He said, I'll give you anything, even the throne of your mother, right? So he's, he's, uh, he's really boastful and uh, filled with juice at this point. And, uh, and he, she says, what I want is on a silver platter, the head of John the Baptist. And Herod is uh, terrified to do it, but he's a man of his word. And he's done it in front of all these, this company at this great feast. So he feels obligated and he has the Baptist uh, beheaded. And it is brought to him, much to his horror, in the lower left, you can see the scene there, beautifully uh, sculpted in bronze. There, the servant, who looks like a medieval knight, kneels in front of Herod and brings on the platter the decapitated head of John the Baptist. And, and Herod uh, moves his hands uh, kind of up as if to push it away, uh, horrified. Whereas his wife uh, seems to be approving. Uh, if we move to the right, uh, here we see Salome, uh, the, the lascivious daughter of Herod, uh, doing her still dancing with beautiful foreshortened hand. He does here, and as far as all the all these details done in perfect perspective on the table, the way the platter sits so squarely on the table, and this man uh, can't even look. Uh, he hides his face from the horror of it all. Um, if we move into um, if we move into the background of the picture, we can see that beyond this space of the let me get back to the the, the whole thing beyond the space that we're in, there's a courtyard people by, by uh, different people. And uh, I want to show you that. So through the windows, through these arcades, we see into a little courtyard where uh, some men are sitting and where well, another young man uh, plays some sort of a musical instrument. It looks like a viol de brachia uh, there uh, to amuse them. It's interesting how he has these posts, these uh, three-dimensional posts come out at us. Of course, it's all it's all done in bas relief, so that uh, he uses perspective in sculpture to create a deep space. Uh, and even beyond this courtyard is another court, is another a room, and we see through the windows into there. And there is the servant with the head of John the Baptist, and and um, and uh, so they're shown a second time there. Uh, if we go to the upper right, we see there's even a room beyond that room, uh, with a stairway that leads up to a door. Uh, and again, these posts that seem to come out and cast shadows at us, all of it done in bas-relief, all of it done uh, like a coin is the most uh, uh, familiar bas-relief. It's a sculpture that is only on one side. And so because he could use the ideas of perspective, uh, uh, he creates this incredible illusion of a deep space on a very, very shallow uh, uh, um, you know, bronze uh, surface. It's incredible. It's incredible. Perspective in the floor for panels, for example. It's, it's exquisite. Now, I want to talk just briefly about bronze because bronze is not sculpted the way marble is. Marble, you have a piece of marble and you cut away, and uh, if you cut away too much, then you have to throw it away. Uh, uh, but bronze is, in a way, a more forgiving medium uh, because you use it's more direct. Uh, uh, but you do not carve directly into bronze. Rather, uh, the original uh, from which the bronze is cast is fashioned in uh, wax, in beeswax, which, as you know, is a very plastic sort of thing. You get it warm in your hand, and you can do a lot of uh, uh, pushing and pulling of it, and it's a very kind of flexible uh, medium. You can uh, use a, a, a iron to heat up certain portions if you need to create a slightly uh, wetter uh, texture. So there's, uh, and I'm not a master at, uh, you know, at uh, uh, you know, wax sculpture, but it is, it is, it is a, an incredible medium. So here, to give you an idea, this is just kind of a diagram. Here's a head, I guess, like a, a Roman bronze head. And over here, you can see there's a clay core. So the artist would first rough the basic forms out. And then he would use, a, he or she would use a very, it was always a he actually in this time because women were not allowed to be apprentices. 
So then a thin, maybe a quarter of an inch thick uh, layer of wax is applied to that roughed out clay core. And on this a wax uh, that covers the clay would be all the details of the nose, of the eyebrows, of the lips, of the nostrils, of the earlobes, and all those sort of details would all be worked out with the wax. Then you can see that there are then these uh, brass pins or bronze pins that are copper pins that are inserted into the wax uh, and, and to anchor it in the clay core. So at this point, what we have is we have a, uh, we have a, uh, a, 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 a clay core, a wax uh, area that has all the detail in it. And so here what we do is we heat the mold up and the wax, which is soft and will respond to heat, melts and drains out. The pins hold the, stop the mold from collapsing in on itself, right? So that it's held apart from the clay core. So then by reversing it, by turning it around and pouring bronze, molten bronze into it, and bronze is a, an alloy of copper and um, copper and tin. And you make this alloy of it and then you pour it, you turn it upside and you pour it in. And then uh, you, when you move the mold, you have this, and you have these spikes kind of coming out to it. And it has a roughness to it. If there are any seams in the, because to take the mold making itself is a whole art. Um, uh, and, uh, and so you have to take it apart and then finish it to give it a finish, give it a patina, to get to file these, uh, these pins down and you have a sculpture. Um, that's your basic idea. There are more elaborate ways of making it without, uh, where, where both the core and the mold are, uh, are, are, are made of plaster. And that way you can make multiples. So for example, you know, the famous Rodin's thinker, there are many uh, originals of it because the mold wasn't broken until eight or nine uh, copies were made. I think one of Donatello's, and of course the, the piece we had just seen was bronze uh, of the Herod's Feast. And this is one of his most uh, famous and celebrated uh, sculptures is, uh, is David. And uh, this has the, uh, and, and David uh, here is very young, maybe 13 years old, just he, he's almost too young of a boy to handle that sword that's in his uh, right hand. In his left hand uh, is the stone with which he killed uh, Goliath, and at his feet is Goliath's head. He's beheaded Goliath and stands triumphantly over David being naked, except for these fancy boots and this uh, hat, this shepherd's hat, uh, uh, garlanded with uh, flowers. Um, and it's the same kind of shepherd's hat that you would see uh, in, the, in the hills surrounding uh, Florence. Um, uh, uh, so he's taking the idea of a shepherd boy and giving it kind of a, a contemporariness. Of course, it's uh, fully nude. And so this was the first, uh, oh, and of course has this uh, element of grazie, of grace. Um, it, it, grazie is the balance, is the complement to gravitas. Gravitas, that heaviness, that substantiality, that presence of the body underneath the garments. Grazie is grace. Uh, and the uh, ideal sculpture, the ideal painting would be an exact balance between grace and heaviness, between grazie and gravitas. And, and, and um, but Donatello's David is, is a great deal of grazie. It was a, uh, a sculpture that's uh, filled with it. Here is, uh, here is uh, Goliath's decapitated head, still with his helmet on as, uh, as David uh, uh, stands over him triumphantly. This is the first sculpture since ancient times that was a sculpture in the round, a fully nude, idealized human figure with that contrapposto um, uh, uh, stance with the engaged leg and the shoulders and the twist and all that sort of stuff, but now in the round. And by the round, we mean that it doesn't have an inch at all. 
It's completely on its own, it stands on a pedestal, and you can walk all the way around it. One thing I failed to mention when we began this talk was that many of the statues, medieval statues that are in their niches, they're not carved in the back at all. They're just rough because no one ever sees that other side. They're always seen just from the front of the niche. Here, David has completely stepped out of his niche into the three-dimensional real world. And this sculpture was bought by the Medici family and was uh, exhibited in their house and also in their garden uh, and was a, a real uh, uh, statement, not just about youth and beauty, but also the triumph of the little guy over the big guy, right? The Florence kind of saw itself as this upstart, young David, a shepherd boy, kind of taken on the big kids of Paris and Rome. Uh, and, and so it, it is uh, not just a religious sculpture that, um, you know, tells us about the story of David from the Bible, uh, but it's also, and more importantly, a civic sculpture in that it, re it represents the, the spirit, the new spirit of Florence, the little guy who, uh, who uh, cuts off the head of the giant, of the beast, and uh, stands triumphantly and gracefully over him. And if we walk all the way around, we see the sculpture is, is fully realized on all sides. It's absolutely uh, beautiful. Then he's looking not only at, uh, you know, young apprentices that are serving as his uh, models. Of course, what he does is he, it's not a, a regular portrait of anyone, but he takes the best aspects of various different shoulders from one boy, the, the nose from another, the chin from another, the feet from another, putting together this idealized uh, persona uh, of, of David. And it just is incredibly an incarnation of Grazie, if ever there was one. It's such a beautiful, um, you know, words almost fail me at the, the incredible uh, beauty and sensitivity. And I think another aspect of it is that, you know, David here is so slight is so young that it calls to mind how could this slender 13 year old boy have defeated this giant of among the Philistines and only by the grace of God, only by grazie, only by grace could this boy have risen to do this heroic uh, uh, feat of, of defeating uh, the Philistines. And in the same way, I suppose, in a way, the Florentines felt that they were defeating the Philistines of, uh, of uh, their surrounding towns, and uh, we were still uh, in the still mired in medieval thought. Whereas here, we find the young uh, man, young David, as the representative of the Florentine spirit, stepping out of his niche entirely, nude and not naked. That is, he nudity is his natural state. He's not at all ashamed. If suddenly my clothes disappeared, I would be naked uh, here. Uh, but David, this is his natural state. Um, and so he's a triumphant uh, male nude. I want to show also this, some of the details of it are so amazing. This kind of almost erotic sort of a thing in that the, this wing that comes out, this, uh, that decorates the helmet of Goliath's head sort of goes up the inner thigh of David, caressing it in this, 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 this uh, almost erotic uh, sort of way. And I'm not saying, you have to be very careful when you say these things in our students, oh, that was gay arts. No, that's not what it means. But there's this eroticism that's there, that if you, if you miss that aspect of it, then you're not getting the full picture either. So I think in a way the David uh, is an embodiment of the idealism of the Renaissance as far as Don Tello was concerned. Um, uh, this is his kind of supreme work. But I want to just give you a little hint of a later work in his last part of his life. And this is carved in wood. He doesn't do that many wood sculptures, but this is the penitent Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene was, according to some stories, was a reformed prostitute that then became the, the principal female disciple of Jesus when he was on earth as a rabbi, a roving rabbi. And, uh, and so she uh, has penitence about her former uh, state of selling the beautiful human body 
uh, for these crass uh, animalistic sort of uh, uh, fulfillment of desire. And so here she takes her former beauty and, uh, uh, and goes and wears rags and wears uh, penitence, uh, you know, a penitential sort of thing. And he shows her uh, as an ideal penitent. It's interesting because he's trying so much to show the ideal form of human beings as they might be in a perfected world. But here he shows someone kind of imperfect on their way to perfection. Because the way to achieve perfection isn't to be perfect from the start, but to start off with all the original sin and everything that, that Christians uh, say is going on um, in human uh, nature. Uh, and she's, uh, she's abrogating all that. She's, she's casting that off. She's being penitent. And, she's, and, and you see the, the remorse in her face. And you see the elderliness of her skin and her, uh, her sagging flesh and so forth. So it's interesting. You see in the middle of the Renaissance by one of the great uh, early masters of the style of ideal form and beauty and balance and order and harmony and unity and all the rest. But here showing this very human, very penitent, very uh, a, 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 a woman on her way to salvation on her way to becoming that ideal uh, that we all uh, drop uh, short of to a greater or lesser extent. So this is in a way then Mary Magdalene is kind of like the second Eve, whereas Eve uh, uh, was also penitent. Here Mary Magdalene through the miracle of Christ's incarnation, she can be reborn and can be transformed into a new being uh, again. So again, um, uh, when I'm saying this, see when I get really involved with this, sometimes my, my students say it's so wonderful to have such a great Christian teacher. And I feel like, well, I don't know, really. I don't know if I'm a good Christian or I don't know what I am really. Uh, but the point is, whatever your own particular religious views are to leave those aside temporarily, the way we suspend our disbelief in theater and enter into the world and the belief world and the and the philosophical world of the artist so that we can understand what he's trying to express. But we don't necessarily have to believe in all the things that the artist believed in, but it's important for us to know those things so that we can interpret it more richly and we can understand where the artist was coming from. And I return us here at the end to Lorenzo's garden, Lorenzo the Magnificent, because I'm very excited about doing another three-part series where we'll be talking about the way in the second half of the century of uh, the artists and philosophers and musicians uh, that surrounded uh, the court of Lorenzo the Magnificent came up with a new uh, interpretation of ancient uh, uh, Platonic thought that, uh, that gave a philosophical basis, not just the mathematical basis, uh, the theoretical basis of perspective, but now enhances that with all philosophy that is, that is derived from Plato on the one hand and from the Christian mysticism on the other of, of, of saints like St. Francis. Okay, so that's what I have uh, for you today. Uh, I could uh, entertain questions. Should I uh, stop the screen share here, I guess, and see if there's any questions. Myself. All right, so let me see if I can unmute everybody. Um, we've got quite a list here. But if you want to ask something, you can unmute yourself. I also have that set up. I have a question. Okay. Uh, what medium did they use to do the replicas in Italy? And has the environment had an effect on the new medium? Uh, no, the new medium is the same. They use marble, Carrara marble. So for example, the David that's outside the uh, Palazzo Vecchio is a copy, perfect copy but it's in Carrara marble. So no, it takes several hundred years for it to really begin to uh, disintegrate. So those copies are, are fine. Uh, but they give us a real idea of the art as of where it was meant to be. Because very often the, the place that the artwork is exhibited or was meant for has a meaning. You know, like David is in front of the Palazzo Vecchio, which is the place where the town hall met. And it used to be, vacuum means old, it used to be the old palace of the Duke in the days before the Renaissance. So to have the David standing out in front of that, and it looks south 
toward Rome. So it's as if like, don't mess with Florence. As you're coming up there <laughs> from across the Arno, you really get this, this feeling of the David is this imposing uh, statue and it's meant to be right there. And if you see it any place else than there, you don't get the full impact of that I think the Colangelo is coming from. Other? And, and, and any other questions? As I try to play director here. <laughs> well, maybe there's not. That's all right, too. It doesn't always have to be questions. But uh, thank you. Uh, oh, I, yes. yes. I, don't, uh, I don't have a question, but I have a comment to make. Oh, yes. Uh, I've noticed on the uh, Donatello's niche sculptures, uh, a lot of the uh, beauty of the sculpture I found was in the garments that they were wearing, the folds in the garments. Yeah. The, the beautiful curves in the folds uh, oh. added to the romance of the uh, figures. I think it, had they been standing in modern day suits, they wouldn't have been as handsome <laughs> a sculpture as, as they were in the, in the robes, uh, which were the garments of the day. And he had a beautiful handling of them, the way he treated the folds. I noticed and, that. And it's to, to, reveal, to reveal the human body underneath. I think that's the thing is that the folds are not the thick sort of heavy folds of the earlier sculptures that, that the folds kind of take over, but instead they reveal the nude underneath. And that's what I think makes them so, so beautiful. Well, yeah, you're right. It's uh, the craftsmanship in this is incomparable. It's just, um, yeah, it's incomparable. I, have a, I have a question if you can hear yes. me. Yes. Um, curious, uh, how do they do the pour? Or like the bronzes, for instance, the, uh, the Donatello's uh, David. That's all. I couldn't quite hear that. Somebody, somebody's banging a plate. If they could not do that. Me? I couldn't hear what you said. Can you go oh. closer to the microphone? Okay, I'm, I'm right on top of it now. Okay, now can I can hear me you. now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to know: Did they do the the, the Donatello? Was that all done? All the bronzes when they're done. Are they done in one pour? Does it have to be done in one pour when they pour the bronze into the mold? Or is it in pieces that then put together later? And both, both types happen. Um, so that sometimes it was done in pieces. The mold making itself is very difficult. But you can imagine yeah. you know, Donatello, the David, he has his hand on his hip. And just imagine, like, just this space under the arm. How do you make a mold that you can right. actually get it out, you know, that you open it up? So mold making itself is a whole uh, craft. And these guys were really good at it. But sometimes very large uh, 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 bronze statues were pieced together, that they're parts of it. Uh, and, of course, the famous one you know, is the Statue of Liberty, you know, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, was brought over in pieces and this. Hey, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. On mute. Okay. Any other questions? That was a wonderful lecture. I, you know, I sit there and I listen to you and I've listened to you for years, but I, I'm just so glad that you're doing these. Um, this is just wonderful for all well, of us. I, I we, learn, learned. we learn so much from this. It's like, I feel like I took a semester with you. Yeah. <laughs> now we'll need to take a field trip to Florence once the, once the, once the plague leaves. Yes, I want to go with you. Who else <laughs> wants to go with the, with Professor Raverty to Florence? I do. I do. I wish I had him. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, he will be, um, this is the last of this series, but we're, as he said, we're planning three more that kind of continue in the fall. I'm hopefully getting, for ULIT people, uh, a newsletter out at the end of August that should list some things. It's kind of tricky how we get it all on, get it all done, and then get it to the printer and not old news. So um, you, uh, ULIT people look for that. But thank you so much, uh, Professor Raverty. And um, I also want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate your support. If we don't have you, we don't do this. So I do very much appreciate it. Um, I think we'll end the recording now. Yes. Okay. And thank you again. And I'll, I will post this. I, I don't have the exact thank address, you. but the if you put in YouTube Raverty Library, 
you'll find our YouTube channel. All right. Be safe. Okay. See you soon. By the way, we have a meditation at 1.30 with our assistant director. She's terrific. So if you want to come back for 40 minutes, we'll do it then. All right. Take care. And thank you once again, Professor Rapp. Thank you everyone. very much. Okay.